everyone, welcome to the Oakley Roots YouTube channel. In today's tutorial, we are not sewing anything. No sewing machine required, because today we're just gonna cut stuff. So today's video is how I cut out pattern pieces, from how I cut them out from the paper, how I cut them out from the material, what if you're using quilt cotton, what if it's too big for your ruler, what if it's on the fold, there's a lot of what ifs. Um, and I get questions all the time, but how do I do this? How? And, and, and it seems so simple. I think a lot of people even are almost afraid to ask because it's like, that's the first step, you know, that, that's the first step is cutting out the pattern piece. And, and if I struggle with that, then, ooh. So I just wanna go through this with you guys and let you know that the pattern piece cutting step should definitely not be stressful or overthought in my opinion. So this is how I cut out pattern pieces. Is this the most efficient, best, smartest way? Probably not, but it works for me. Uh, and so therefore it is the best, most efficient, smartest way for me to do it. If you have a better way to do it, definitely leave it down in the comment section down below. Uh, there are so many options to cutting things out. So I'm just gonna kind of run through a list. I did ask on Instagram for questions. So I'll do a Q and A as well if I don't cover those things throughout the tutorial. So first we're gonna go through all my favorite stuff to use, so favorite rollers, favorite cutting utensils, and favorite uh, marking tools, which are my must-haves for cutting out pattern pieces. And then we're gonna go through how to cut big things using rulers or templates or how to put together the pattern piece as well as how to cut out the paper pattern piece and put that together. We're gonna go through all of that. And then at the very end, I will go through all the questions asked on Instagram. And if there's anything I didn't cover already, we'll cover that in the end. So if you're new to the Oak Lords YouTube channel, please consider clicking subscribe down below. If at any point you like this video, please give it a like. Any questions, comments, shout outs, anything at all, leave them down in the comment section. I'll probably have timestamps. This should be a very, very quick video, uh, but I probably will have timestamps. If you're just like, what was that one kind of pen she liked to use? You can just click over there and you'll find it. I'll also have links for everything that I can link up uh, down in the description of this video. So right over here should be a little arrow. You can click that and the description will expand. That's where you're gonna find the timestamp links as well as the product links. All right, guys, let's get started. So to start, we can start, we can still chat like this. Let's go over my favorite rulers. I have four rulers I use all the time. Well, five, but I don't always use this. Here, let me grab my fifth ruler. Okay. Five rulers I use all the time. I have probably about 50 different rulers, all kinds of different sizes. So the best rulers for you are gonna be the ones you have, okay? These are just the ones that I happen to reach for all the time, probably because they're literally on top of the stack. So the first ruler, which I think everybody should have this size actually, is a six inch by 24 inch ruler that is easy to see through, okay? That's the key here. Easy to see through and non-slip. So I honestly, there are so many different types of rulers like this. I recommend this one. This is called Quilter Select. This is actually my favorite brand of rulers. Um, you can see they kind of have a, a dingy yellow color, <laughs> like it's not the prettiest ruler, but it's very unlikely you're using fabric that is dingy yellow with black lines. So you're going to be able to see everything using this ruler. There's really no material that you're going to lay this on top of and you're not going to be able to really see the grid lines and everything. Quilter Select are also known for their little grippy back. Okay, so it has like a, it's not sticky. I don't know how to describe it. It's not sticky, it doesn't, it just feels good. It's not, you could put it on fabric, it doesn't slide around, it stays put. You can see it's just like, like you see the fabric stays there, it doesn't move around. Um, but again, it's not sticky, it doesn't have any residue. I have had these, oh my gosh, probably six years or longer, and I've never replaced them. They don't, I haven't broken, and I am rough on my tools, okay? I'm very rough. These things get dropped, stepped on all the time. Um, and it's never broken, it's never scratched, and this there's no like, the stickiness hasn't stopped. It still works exactly like it did the day I bought it. So highly recommend this. Also, this is great for bag straps, things like that. You're gonna sometimes have to cut pieces of material that are like 56 inches long. Don't go get a 56 inch long ruler if that even is possible. Don't, don't do that. Uh, you can use these for all of that. So definitely recommend this one. Um, a lot of rulers, I'm gonna say whatever brand you like, whatever color you like, but this one I would I would do this exact ruler. In my personal opinion, this is the one you need. Since we're talking about Quilter Select, I'll show you my other ones. Uh, six inch by 12 inch ruler, you can get this from anywhere. I just, you guys know I love Quilter Select because again, the dingy yellow and the non-slip coating on the back, which like, how does it never come off? I mean, I have scratched this thing up 
How has it never come off? I, I need to figure this out now, but um, six inch by 12 inch ruler, standard, standard size, easy to see through. There's so many fun, pretty rulers. I mean, we make really pr pretty rulers, pretty templates, things like that. With rulers though, especially if you're gonna be using it for quilting or like cutting big things, you have to be able to see through them. You have to be able to see the grid marks. You have to be able to like, use them as a technical instrument. Um, there are plenty of things out there we can use that are very helpful and it doesn't really matter how see-through or pretty they are. Um, it's just, it's just helpful. This one is a technical tool, so you have to be able to see through it. Um, and I prefer again, this brand over any other brand. So six inch by 12 inch, probably unique to me. I don't talk to a lot of people who use this size, but I love the three inch by 12 inch as well. Um, I just find I'm using this a lot, especially I'll layer these together. So if I have to cut something that's nine inches by 12 inches, you know, you can just kind of smush them next to each other on your material, and there you go, you have a bigger ruler. Um, so these two together, I really like. I don't need to have multiple six inch by 12 inch rulers. I just feel like it takes up a lot of space and it is so cluttered in here all the time trying to film and make things. Uh, I, I, I need what I need out and nothing else. So this combo works perfect for me. So three inch by 12 inch, six inch by 12 inch. Another kind of off the wall ruler, but I find it really useful. This is a 10 and a half inch by 10 and a half inch creative grids ruler. I love this. If you're quilting, a lot of times you do have to cut these angles. So it's really helpful to have these angles. It's also just kind of an odd size. Like I, I like it because on the back, instead of the coating, it has like these little grippy dots, which it works. It is more slippery though. I mean, it is like, like I'll show you. Here's a creative grids ruler. And then here is my quilter select. Like you see the fabric is actually bunching up. It doesn't want to move. So, you know, it does, it is slippery. Um, it does chip. You can see, I have the corners here. I don't know if you can see, but like corners have chipped off over time. Again, I am very rough with my material and my tools. So that's not surprising, but the size of it is really, really nice. There's lots of like, there's fractions on here. It says one and a half, two and a half, things like that. Um, it's helpful. I don't know. <laughs> Like I wouldn't say like everybody has to have a 10 and a half inch by 10 and a half inch ruler, but I do. Like I have to have this ruler. These are the rulers I have to always have. So this is really handy, especially again, just kind of odd size things. It's just handy to have something like this, like a square ruler. Um, and then of course you guys know my one inch by six inch ruler, any brand at all, any brand out there, um, just a one inch by six inch ruler that's accurate. It's going to be really helpful. It's mostly helpful for marking things when you're in the middle of building, but it also is helpful for cutting small things if you just need to like cut a one inch thing. Um, there you go. So those are my go-to rulers. Those are the ones I use all the time. They're always laying right here on the table. I'm actually always trying to move them out of the way so you don't see them in the shot. Um, but those are my rulers that I have all the time on the table. Again, I have so many other ones. I have bigger ones, wider ones. I have a 12 inch, I have so many other rulers. I just don't use them. Um, I think if there's like something very specific, I would probably look for them and use them, but I never need to. Those are the ones I'm good with. But again, whatever size you have is gonna be great. If you have a 12 inch by 12 inch ruler that you like using, don't go get a 10 and a half inch by 10 and a half inch. You don't need to. Um, but I do suggest if you've never looked at Quilter Select rulers, please check them out because they are very, very well made. Okay, next up is cutting tools. This is pretty boring. Um, I always use my Kai scissors for cutting out pattern pieces. I love these. These are Kai 7230. These are my favorite. Um, I love the angle of them. I love how heavy they are. I love how thick they are. I am a tracer and cutter. I like to trace things and then I like to hand cut it. That takes more time. A lot of people, like if they do trace them, they'll just rotary cut it. I don't have that skill set, so um, I can't do that. I do have my rotary cutter though, which I usually always use either with a ruler or with a template. Um, I will show you some templates today, how to cut using templates. Um, but yeah, my rotary cutter is a 45 millimeter whatever brand you want. I like the cheapest, the Ulfas. These ones are things you can get at any craft store. Uh, they're lightweight, they're easy to use. Your blades need to be good. I forgot the exact blades. I, I've gone through a lot of bad blades. I will put a link down below for the blades I like to use though, because these ones do last the longest. And please change your blades. <laughs> like, please change your rotary blades. If you're cutting, it's dangerous, okay? It's dangerous. First, always have the safety on. You see, you pull it down, now you can cut. If you're not cutting, put that safety back on. There's a lot of people missing fingertips in the sewing world because they, they did not put their safety back on. Uh, make sure you have your safety on. And then again, if you're finding like you're cutting and it 
didn't cut all the way, change the blade. Don't even try it, don't even go, don't even do it again, change the blade, okay? If you're cutting and it cuts most of it, there's like little nicks every three inches or so, that's because you have a nick in your blade, change your blade. A, a, a dull blade, just like in the kitchen, a dull blade is a dangerous blade, okay? Because now you're gonna use more force, you're gonna have less control, and you're gonna slice your fingertip off, okay? We don't need anybody going to the hospital without a fingertip because they, all they had to do was change their blade. Please change your blade. Okay, finally, my marking tools of choice, always. A friction pen, whatever color, green, blue, black. Um, I like to have a friction pen. I use this a lot for chasing pattern pieces. I do not draw on my fabric that I'm going to then sew onto the bag because friction pens are erasable. They erase with heat. So you can draw all over something, get it hot, and it goes away except it comes back, the ghost of the mark will come back. So it is only used for tracing pattern pieces or marking inside seams, that's it. Next, I have a chalk marking tool. This is helpful, especially when you're working with wax canvas um, or some sort of material that's a little bit darker, doesn't really hold ink very well, or you're a little worried that it's gonna like bleed out. So a chalk tool, this is the best one. This is the Clover chalk tool, white chalk is the best. Um, it just shows up the best and it erases the easiest. So I highly recommend this one. This always, you should have a couple of these at all times. This is a sew line air erasing marker. When it erases, it actually does erase. You can mark all over your fabric, air over time will erase it and it will not come back. So I love these, again, for pattern tracing, for placement marks. If I have to like draw on fabric, like right in the center, like this is where something has to go, I use this. And finally, my silver ink pen. This is from Mormino. Um, this is a vinyl marking tool, but I also will use it for dark fabric. So I'll show you today. I will use this on quilt cotton for dark fabric to trace things as well. It works for everything. It's a silver pen. Uh, if you're using it on vinyl, you can put it wherever you want and then wipe it off. If you're using it on fabric, you can only put it on the outside. It will not wipe off the center. So these are my four go-tos. Okay, now we're gonna go top down and we're gonna actually start cutting some things. So I get asked a lot if I use pattern weights. Personally, I do not, but I was actually just gifted this recently at the So Magical Expo. I need to find out who made them and if they're selling them yet because she gifted one to me, she gifted one to my mom. We both have been using it a lot um, for different things, but this is a beautiful item. So pattern weights are great because you wanna keep things in place. I'll show you. Uh, I don't normally use them, but that's just because I usually just put my arms down like this and hold it and trace, which is not smart. So um, I, I, I'm gonna try it out today. Okay, so here's one of my patterns. This is a vinyl notebook holder. Um, first question I got all the time, when you cut out the pattern piece, do you cut on the line, inside the line, or outside the line? I cut on the line, that's how I do it, okay? I cut on the line. Um, to be completely honest, it should not matter. <laughs> when you're building bags, most of the time, you're gonna have a 3 8 inch seam allowance which means it doesn't matter if you cut on inside or outside the line, it's all gonna work out in the end, you're gonna be fine. Uh, but to be precise, I like to cut on the line. When I am coming up with my own patterns, I usually do a pretty skinny line. So you can see the line going around here is pretty thin. So if you cut on the line, you're all gonna pretty much have the exact same shape, right? Uh, sometimes patterns have very thick, thick lines, and that is when it can get a little bit more difficult. If they've got, you know, a quarter inch thick pattern line, where you cut is going to matter. So I always cut on the line, straight down the middle. So you can see, I always have a pair of paper scissors, not these. Please don't touch paper with these beautiful scissors over here. They're too expensive to ruin. These are just some fun paper scissors from Target and I will cut right on the line, just like that. So that's how I cut the pattern pieces out originally. Now let's say you have a situation like this where you have two pattern pieces that need to come together. What I do for that is I will cut out one pattern piece along all the cut edges just like this. And then on the other pattern piece where it has to connect, I leave a lot of overhang. So you can see here, I did not cut right on that line, I leave a half inch, whatever, overhang of paper hanging off the sides. It doesn't have to be pretty, it just needs to be there. Because then what I can do is I can take my other piece where I did cut right on the line and I can lay it on top of that hangover, <laughs> hangover, on top of that hangover paper and I can line up my connectors. So you'll always have some sort of a symbol or a letter or something to connect the two pieces. 
so I can connect them. And then I just grab some good old Scotch tape. Any tape will work. If you want to use washi tape, that's fine. But I have them like that. And then it's just really easy to tape them together. I can flip it over, tape it on the back as well. There we go. And now I know it's perfectly lined up. I don't have any little gaps or anything between my lines. You know what I mean? So that little bit of overhang is also really helpful when you have to combine two pattern pieces together. All right, so now let's talk about what you do when you have a pattern piece like this that needs to be cut on the fold. That means that this pattern piece is only half the size it needs to be. In the end, it needs to be this and this. It needs to be one big piece, not two separate pieces. So. Fold means if you're using material like quilt cotton, you can open it all up and then you can fold it in half. And then here is the fold, right? So then you take your pattern piece and you line it up on the fold, just like this. And so you just make sure the full edge is lined up on the fold of the fabric. So you kind of have to finagle it a little bit. I always like to use clips for this. And so these clips, they have a rounded bit and a flat bit. The flat bit, I'm usually not particular about which goes where, but for this, I am. The flat bit goes against the table so that way it doesn't bubble up your pattern. So the flat bit goes against the table and I just clip down this side here. And this is where a pattern weight would be helpful as well. So you can just kind of push down the pattern weight because we wanna smush down the fabric. And you could iron this fabric before you do this if you'd like, I don't, because I'm gonna be ironing it afterwards anyways. And again, I just don't think you have to be that precise about things, but you could. Um, I find tracing a pattern piece with this can be a little tricky. So for something like this, I would either use a vinyl marker to trace out the outside of the pattern. And you can see when I trace things, I'm not that precise. Again, I'm just, Bag making, you have a lot of wiggle room. It's not like a quilt block. Everything doesn't have to be exactly to a 16th of an inch the right size. So you can see, I'm just gonna go around with my vinyl marking tool. Now I know it's for vinyl, but it works on fabric too because it's dark. Also notice that a lot of times dark colored fabric is a light on the back. So instead you could flip this the other way and you could use your air erasing marker by tracing it on the back of the fabric. But I'm already here and I already have it set up like this. So I'm just gonna use my vinyl marker to go around just like that. Okay, so then I'm just gonna kind of hold this down quickly. Okay, everything, my line is everywhere I can see it. So with quilt cotton, you're gonna find it easiest if you grab some pins, some nice small pins, because now we need to cut this out, but we don't wanna open it up, right? We wanna stay like this. We wanna cut around here. If you're really comfortable with a rotary cutter, you could lift up your pattern piece and cut. I'm not. So I grab pins and I go around close to the edge and I'm just adding some pins between both layers of fabric. There we go. And I do this before I lift up my pattern piece because that way if anything gets, you know, adjusted, I can still just push this down and make sure we're all good. So you can see I'm just going around the edges. Okay, so now I'm gonna remove my weight. And what I do is gently one by one, I pull out the paper from the clips. You can see I'm not moving the clips, I'm only moving the paper because I don't wanna mess with that edge. I want it to stay just like that. There we go. So now I have my edge and my mark. And because I have it pinned, you can add a few more pins. Remember, quilt cotton, you can pin all over the place. Those holes are not gonna show. With something like cork or vinyl, you don't wanna do that. So now I'm just gonna rotate this. And looking at my mark, I'm just gonna go around. And you can see I like to have my pins pretty close to the line. The further away the pins are from that line, the more likely your fabric, especially if you did not iron it like me, <laughs> the more likely your fabric's gonna spread apart and it's gonna be hard to cut both the front and the back at the same time. But adding the pins close to the edge makes this very easy. So you can see, I don't, I try not to wrestle with it too much. So like right here, I have to cut off this little sliver. So I'll just cut off the whole fabric, throw that to the side and then continue going around. And when I'm cutting this out, I'm cutting once again on the line. So I'm not cutting inside the line, I'm not cutting outside it, I'm cutting on the line. I know <laughs> that might not be the same size as this because you cut this on the line, but when you traced it, you traced it outside the line. So now you're cutting it on the line, which is technically outside this line. Don't overthink it, just don't overthink it, it's okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna remove my clips, remove all my pins. 
And I always like to have these magnetic pin dishes. If you're a quilter, you're gonna use pins all the time. If you're a bag maker, not as much. So now you see, I'll just open this up. I know it's all wrinkled. And there we go. And now I'll iron it and then I'll add any interfacing. Um, I always add interfacing after I cut things out. I don't add interfacing before I cut it out. That's just a personal preference. Um, but I'll just iron this out, add my interfacing, and now it's the exact size I want it to be. You can see it is twice as big as my template, which is perfect. So now let's say you're not working with quilt cotton. Instead, you're working with vinyl or cork or something that can't be folded like that because if you try to fold it, you're gonna end up with this really awful looking crease. For that, we do a lot of tracing. So we're gonna grab our pattern. And we're gonna lay our pattern like this. So I'm gonna trace it so that I can do both sides at once. So first what I do is I line this up. Once again, let's just grab this pattern weight. I already find this really helpful. So I'm just gonna put my pattern weight down. Any sort of marking tool you prefer. Since this is a light colored material, I can use my air erasing marker. Uh, if I was doing it on the front, I could use it or I could use my vinyl marker, whatever is easiest. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at the top and I just kind of go down like that. Especially if you're tracing it on the front, don't trace a full line down the center. You don't need to. Uh, depending on what marking tool you're using, it might not work out. Actually, let's use the friction this time. We'll use friction. So like, let's say you were using friction, don't do this on the front of the material. On the back of the material, it's fine. But on the front, don't do that. Once again, so you can see, I just kind of hold down my fingertips along the edge and just lightly take my marking tool and follow it. Paper is not thick. I mean, I'm not using cardstock. I'm just using regular computer printer paper, but it's thick enough if you have a light hand where you don't, you don't, I mean, I go off the edge all the time, but I'm not like cutting it. I'm not crinkling it. I'm not fighting with it. So I'm gonna go around the whole outer edge. And then for the center line, I do a nick on the bottom a little nick on the top and usually one small nick in the center. I like to have three points like that. So I'll remove this and then I'm gonna flip this over. So we're gonna mirror it, right? Flip it over. And I'm gonna line up the top corner, the bottom corner and the center with my little lines, just like that. Put down my pattern weight and now I'm just gonna continue tracing along the other side. Again, you see how I just put my fingertips right along the edge and I'm like holding the pen almost on the top half of it. I'm not holding it down by the bottom, just a light hand. And if it's messy, that's okay. I don't know if you can see over here, but it got all messy. That's okay. As long as I know, you know, for the most part where I need to be, it'll be fine. Okay. So now if you're comfortable with a rotary cutter, you could just follow along that line and cut. I know lots of people can do that. I just can't, or you can grab your scissors, like I like to do, and just cut again right on that line all the way around. Now I will tell you, <laughs> if you're using a template, so these are one of the templates we sell in the shop. We love these templates. Our templates are typically an eighth of an inch thick. They are slidey, they are not, they don't have a nice backing like these rulers do, okay? So it will slide around, you have to be very careful. Uh, with these templates, you can definitely hold it down and trace just like that. You see how quick that is? It doesn't require a whole lot of work. It's very easy. There we go, right? Or if you're careful, please hold it down firmly, not with all your body weight, because if you do that, what happens is you're gonna take your rotary cutter and you're gonna do something like this. Goodbye fingertip. We don't wanna lose fingertips, remember? All fingertips are required, so we don't wanna lose anything. You can firmly, but with control, hold down the template Take your rotary cutter, a sharp blade means you don't have to push it down really hard, okay? Take your rotary cutter and just follow along the template. You can do this with any sort of acrylic template. I would say as long as it's an eighth of an inch thick or thicker. If it's thinner than that, I would not suggest doing it because it's too easy for these blades to go up over the template and then cut your finger. So you can see, again, I'm gently but with control going around. There we go. And I'll just kind of lift it up, make sure I got everything. I get everything. Just have this down here, that's it. Easy peasy. I only do that with templates, again, that I know I can work with. Just please be careful. Um, I do have a product I, that I ordered that I'm gonna try out soon, which is like a spray backing so that hopefully maybe we can get this kind of effect with our templates. I have not tried it out yet, but once I do, 
I will do a whole video on it. Um, but until then, if you're using these templates, be very careful. But they are helpful at cutting this stuff out. Okay, so let's say you have a scrap of material like this and you wanna cut out like a three inch or, you know, a three inch by three inch square, okay? Uh, sometimes people get a little stressed out about that. So what I like to do, especially if I'm trying to really preserve my scraps, I try to find a straight edge. So like right here is a straight edge. So I'll use that and I'll line up my ruler, my three inch mark here on that straight edge. Now this is a three inch by 12 inch ruler. So you can see if I line up my three inch line on that straight edge, and then I go here, here, and here on the bottom and the left and right, I'll have a three inch square. And this ruler again is one of the few rulers that I feel very comfortable using a rotary cutter with. So all I have to do is slice and slice and slice. And then I can lift this up and then I have a perfect little small cut. So small cuts are easy. The goal with small cuts is always find a straight edge. If you don't have a straight edge, make one. Maybe that means like right here, this isn't quite straight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna line up my ruler like this and I'm going to trim off a bit of it. And now I have a straight edge. You don't have to lose a lot of material to make a straight edge. But once you have one straight edge, then you can start doing the rest of it. Then you can do the left and the top, cut off that, cut off the other side. So let's say we wanna do a two inch by three inch cut here, but this is all messed up over here. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna line up my three inch mark with the straight edge on the bottom. And then I have my two inch mark. I'm making sure it's not overhanging, but it's right here. I'm gonna cut on the left. I'm gonna cut on the top, just like that. Now you see when I pull it, it's all, <laughs> It's a mess, right? I mean, I could easily just trim this off. There we go. And now I have this. So then I'm gonna take my ruler and I'm gonna work with the sides I've already cut. So I'll line up my two inch mark over here on the left. I always like to use half inch marks because they're really easy to see. So I'll show you. I'm gonna line up my two inch line over here on the left and my half inch dash line up here on the top, just like that. And then I'll take my rotary cutter and just cut off the right side because that's the only side I have left. And now I have a perfect cut. Very easy. So smaller cuts are not so difficult. Again, the strategy is always make sure you have a straight edge somewhere. And if you don't have one, make one and then work off of that. All right, we're gonna continue working with our cork here. So let's think of a size that can be tricky to cut. Let's see, let's try, let's try 13 inches by, 15 inches, how's that? That's a tricky one, 13 inches by 15 inches. I don't have any ruler that's 13 inches by 15 inches, but I do have this ruler here, so I can use this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with this bottom edge. Again, I'm always searching for a straight edge. So I'm gonna do, get my 15 inch mark and I'm gonna line that up on the bottom edge here, okay? So I know this is six inches, right? If I take a second ruler, I know that's gonna be 12 inches. I can just kind of match it up on the bottom here, just like that, right? And if I take my third ruler, now I'm going to have 15 inches. I don't need 15 inches over here, I need 13 inches, right? So this is how I do it. I like to trace things and cut them by hand, but you could use your rotary cutter. So I'll show you how to do the rotary cutter. Tracing is easier though. So you can see I have my straight edge down here. I lined up all the bottoms of my rulers. I know those are good. What I need to cut is up here and then all the way along the top, but these aren't up there. So what I do is I hold the left one in place and I'm just going to gently slide this up there. Remember, this is kind of sticky, so it doesn't want to slide easily. And I'm matching up the grid lines on both my rulers. This is helpful if both rulers are by the same brand. And see when I do this and I line this one up as well, I can see 13 inches, so this is six, 12, and then one more inch would be 13 inches that's not going to come all the way where I need it. So I have to move everything to the left and start again. So once again, first thing I do is line up my big ruler with the 15 inch mark on the bottom. And then I'm gonna take this ruler, line it up with the grid marks. And then I'm gonna take my third ruler and line those up with the grid marks. Let's say you don't have three rulers. Let's say you just have one. What you could do is similar to what we did when we cut on the fold. You could trace out this, and then once you get over here to the six inch mark, make yourself a few 
marks like that, and then just move your ruler over. So I'll show you that as well, okay? But if I wanna make this big rectangle, I can trace it, and then trace the top all the way over until I get to the one inch mark. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just kind of make a tick like that, but then I'm gonna shift everything. So I'm gonna move this over, move this over here, move this over here. So now on my smaller roller, I'm gonna line it up. One inch is gonna cover this drawn line right here and making sure all the grid lines are matched up everywhere. And see the top right corner is now matched up with that tick mark because this is overhanging, right? You see down here, it's overhanging two inches, that's perfect. And then I can just mark down this side and there we go. Now I have, ignore this, <laughs> now I have a nice 15 inch by 13 inch square by using three rulers. If we had to use one ruler, again, please make sure you have a ruler this big. You line it up, always on a straight edge, trace up one side, trace the top. Once I get to the far right edge, mark a few lines like this, all the way down to the bottom, make sure you mark the bottom and then move your ruler over, line up the 15 inch mark on your straight edge, and then line up the left hand side with those marks. There we go, so now I know we have here, so now I'll trace the top to continue my line, and then once again, I'll mark little tick marks, always on the back of my material. And this is best if you're using cork or vinyl. If you're using quilt cotton, you can always fold things by doing some math, we'll do that in a moment. And then, I can just move this whole ruler over so that the one inch grid mark is on these dashed lines. Because again, six, 12, 13, right? So my one inch mark is covering those dashed lines and I can continue the top edge and then go down the right edge. There we go. And now I just use this to cut it out. And so I use my big ruler to measure it out and then we're gonna rotate it to double check and it is at 13 inches. Perfect. So that's how I would use my rulers to cut big squares, big rectangles on faux leather, vinyl, cork, anything I don't want to fold. So now let's say we need to cut a strip of fabric that is two inches by 56 inches, right? Bag straps, we do that all the time. You're going to first need to make sure you have material that's long enough for that or that you want to sew together to create a bag strap. But let's just say we want one continuous strip. So I'm gonna grab my material, let's see. I don't know if I have enough for 56 inches here. To measure this, I'm gonna fold my material in half, then I'm gonna use the grid on my cutting mat here. Let's see, that gets to 24 inches, so this is 48 inches. We'll make it work, that's fine. So we have it like this. The trick is, you need to make it a cuttable size. So for material like this that can be folded, you can just keep folding it. Now this is a cuttable size, but let's say it was bigger. What I would do is I would line up the top edge, so I have the raw edge here. I'd line it up, fold it in half once, and I'm gonna fold it in half again. Okay, so I fold it in half twice. Change your rotary blade out if you think you need to, because when you have this many layers, you don't wanna cut yourself. Um, so I fold it in half twice. Now, this is not all lined up. This is probably not all lined up, that's okay. I'm going to take my ruler, and I'm going to line it up so I have a grid mark that is straight on the fold over here on the left. So that's my concern right now. You can see it's all angled down, that's okay. I want this to be straight right here. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut the top off. Because the first thing I need is a straight edge. There's my straight edge. And now, holding it all together, I'm going to move my ruler up. What did I say, I wanted two inches? So I'm gonna move up so that the two inch mark is running right along that top straight edge. And then over here on the left, my grid mark is lining up with the fold. We don't want this angled or else you're gonna have a wonky wavy strap. So we want it just like this. And I'll be honest, down here, this is hanging off the side of the table and I'm holding it with my belly. I just push my belly against the table and that's how I hold it. You could grab some pattern weights and that would help too. And now carefully, I'm gonna take my rotary cutter. And when I rotary cut, I'm not rotary cutting at an angle. I'm going straight down, straight down, and I'm not shoving it against the ruler. I'm just going straight down and letting the ruler guide it. And you can see I'm always moving my hand, kind of, 
kind of creepy like I'm always moving it over so that my hand is right next to where I'm cutting it's not over here and then everything twists all right so we move that and now we have one nice long cut to make a strap very easy now if I were trying to cut a long strip like that using cork or vinyl something I cannot fold over and over again that's when I use a marking tool um, and you just line up again straight edge most of the time your cork or your vinyl if you get it on a roll one edge should be very straight and you just line up your ruler just like that you can mark it and then cut it with scissors or you can just hold it in place and then just trim carefully along and just move your ruler down as you're trimming uh, without much problem as long as you have that straight edge the thing about cork and vinyl is that it doesn't really stretch or anything so where you line it up over here at two inches will be the same as where you line it up over here at two inches. Quilt cotton is woven and it can stretch and kind of get wavy. So you might measure it over here and then you go over here and it's like, it's tilted, it's a mess. Um, so cork and vinyl a little bit easier. Woo wee, even for me, that's a lot of talking. Um, I hope I answered a lot of questions. I know I just kind of like, like flooded you with cutting information. Um, I really wanna make sure that if you have any questions, they get answered. So now I'm gonna go on my phone and I'm going to find some of the questions and we'll see if we can go through them. So do you cut the fabric before or after putting on woven interfacing? I always cut my fabric before. I cut out the fabric and then I just take a big sheet of woven interfacing and I put it over the back of the fabric and then from the wrong side, the soft side, I guess, um, the non-sticky side of the woven interfacing, I iron it on. Uh, yes, that does mean that some of the glue gets onto my pressing mats. It's never been a problem. It's never like gotten onto other projects or anything like that. Uh, but that's how I do it. Some people like to like fuse their entire fabric with the woven interfacing. I just don't always know I'm going to need to do that. And so I don't want to essentially kind of ruin a whole piece of fabric from other projects. Um, if I don't need it. So I, I cut my fabric out first. I don't cut out woven interfacing using pattern pieces. I cut the fabric with the pattern piece and then I put the woven interfacing over the back of the fabric. I press it on and then I cut around it. Time wise, it's better if you just fuse your woven interfacing to your fabric to begin with and then just cut it. Wouldn't it be great if they sold fabric that already had the woven interfacing on it? Like that would be perfect because I can't stand interfacing things. It's like the worst step. It's the worst part of it. Okay, so cutting thicker materials on the fold, like I said, you lay it one side, trace it, flip it, trace it, and then I cut it with scissors. Uh, somebody else asked how to not make it look so scissory. Like, <coughs> my advice is who's gonna see it? Like, unless it's a raw edged project, if it's a raw edged project, cut it out, sew it together, and then just shave it nice and smooth. Go around, like when we do the Pocket Pal, when we do the Anna wallet, um, just very gently shave it at the end to clean it up. Don't worry about it looking perfect in the beginning because if it's going to be eaten up in the seam anyways, no one's gonna see it. If it's going to be left a raw edge project, as you're layering all your things together and sewing it, things are naturally just going to shift. Like it's just not going to stay perfect the whole time you're sewing. So just be okay with that, you know, and then clean it up at the end. I think my biggest tip when it comes to cutting material is like, give yourself a break. You know, from my perspective, this is what I've seen a lot of. You have people from a quilt making background or people who are just starting out and it's like everything has to be perfect. Cause when you're making a quilt block with teeny tiny little pieces and you have to have an exact scant quarter, there's not even like a measurement. It's just a scant quarter inch seam allowance. It's like a, like, what was it? Like a, like a three sixteenths of an inch or something. I don't know. Um, it has to be perfect. But with bags, we don't do that. Bags, I mean, maybe we'll have quarter inch seam allowance. Most of the time we have a three eighths inch seam allowance to a half inch seam allowance. The bigger the seam allowance, the more mistakes you can make, the less precise everything has to be. If everything doesn't match up to a 16th of an inch, it's gonna turn out perfect. No one's ever gonna know. But then I've seen like people who have a clothing making background and they come in all kinds of willy nilly because with clothing, it's just, I look at clothing as like cooking and quilting is like baking and bag making is in the middle. Like cooking, it's just like, you know, season to taste. What does that mean? I don't know. How much of what seasoning? That's like, like making clothes. You know, when you make clothes, it's like, make a flowy seam or like 
complete to taste. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know what that means. How much? Where am I sewing? What's it like? What am I measuring? It's just all willy nilly, you know? Uh, and then quilting is like baking. Like we need exactly this weight of the material. You know what I mean? So it has to be perfect or else it's just not gonna line up right. Bag making is right in the middle. Yes, we have a pattern. We have a like, you know, ingredients and um, a recipe. Uh, but at the same time, eh, if they're a little off, like that's okay. If it's not a perfect, you know, quarter inch around the curve, it's okay. If it's a little janky over here, that's fine. Like it's still gonna turn out great. So it's like right in the middle, you know what I mean? So is getting pattern weights worth it to hold pattern pieces down to cut? I mean, if they look this good, I find this very helpful. I found this very, very helpful. I was just using it for this. Uh, again, I don't normally use pattern weights, but I thought this was really helpful. I have like a magnetic, I have like magnetiles or something, magnet things. Uh, I don't use those. I actually use those for my laser now. Um, they're just kind of more trouble than they were worth. You have to like put the metal underneath and then put, eh. I don't know about you guys, but cutting out the pattern pieces and interfacing them are the steps I hate the most. <laughs> like I wouldn't say, okay, not hate the most, that's strong. They are the steps I like the least. That's what I mean. Um, because it's just, it's exhausting and it takes a while and I just, it's not like the fun stuff. It's not making it, you know, it's prepping time. Um, so anything that adds extra time and extra work, I don't wanna use it. It has to be quick and easy. How do you deal with cutting fabric that frays badly? So in that situation, if it's a real fur, okay, so like cotton lycra, cotton lycra for bag making, cotton lycra is, it has its own mind. Again, it is it's meant for clothing because it is, <laughs> it is its own like species. Um, cotton lycra though for bag making is very hard to cut out because it does fray, but it also like just, just stretches and goes everywhere. So for that, interface it first and then cut it out. So if you have material that frays terribly, interface it with woven interfacing first. You're going to probably need to interface it with woven interfacing at some point in the pattern anyways because of the fraying. So interface it first and then cut it out and you won't have any problem with fraying. So how do you store your pattern and pattern pieces? So guys, I make at least one bag a week um, and I very rarely make the same thing more than that one time for the video, right? Cause there's just no time. Every week it's something new, something new, something new. So most of the time I print out the pattern, I cut it out, I make it a couple times and then I throw away the pattern pieces because I cannot keep them. But I will show you the ones I have kept. Oh my gosh, this is so heavy. So I have these back here. Uh, and this is, I, you can see, I, I was trying to be organized. So I would like, let's find one in here. Let's see. So here's one. I would get these manila envelopes. I would print out the pattern picture on the front. I would washi tape it down. And then inside I have the printout with the instructions and pattern pieces. So pattern pieces already cut out folded, put in there. That was the goal um, originally, but I quickly ran out of space and energy. And so now I just kind of shove them in there. So I've got some of these. Yeah, I just, I don't have the ability to go back to patterns a whole lot, but like when I do, so like here's one, this is so yours, Betsy Bowler. I loved this bag so much. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep this pattern. So um, I put it in there and you can see it's too big. So I will like, like here's the gusset. I just fold it and then I put it in here. And you know, one day when I'm stressed out with this bin, I'll probably make more of these pretty envelopes for everything else, but I don't have a good way of storing them. I, some people like to use uh, folders, like three wing binders with the plastic inserts and they put them in there. That sounds good. Um, I don't have, I don't have, I don't, I don't know, I don't have the energy. And then I have a whole bunch of purchase patterns that I just kind of keep in there. Who knows when I'm gonna use them? Okay, pattern pieces with multiple purposes. For example, they have the interfacing as a dash line. So I'm just gonna draw a dash line on here as an example. Okay, so let's say you have something like that where you have your pattern piece and it has the dash line and the dash line is the size of the interfacing and the pattern piece is the size of the material. Um, first of all, how many of these are you making? If you're like, yeah, everybody's getting one of these for Christmas, print out two sets. Print out one that you cut for the exterior, print out another set and cut on the dash line. And now you have two sets. You have your exterior and you have your stabilizer sets. If you're like, I just wanna make one or two of these, uh, like me, what I do, especially, especially for like foam and things like that, I will grab a seam ripper and I will just put my seam ripper in the dash line, gently rip 
around the dash lines. You don't have to do every single one of them, but I will go around and rip the dash lines. And then I will lay this on my interfacing and I'll grab my marking tool and I just make sure my marking tool goes inside that rip and then I trace just the little dash lines and then you can usually easily just like follow it along or just use scissors to cut it out. That's how I do it. Somebody asked how to make it less frustrating. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I always say if I hired somebody for help, that's what they would be doing. They would be cutting out everything and interfacing everything. And then honestly, even when I think about that, I'm like, that's just cruel because I just like doing it so much. I'm like, how could I, even if I pay, like, even if I'm paying them, like, I couldn't ask somebody else to do that. It's just, it's just the worst. Do you include the interfacing in the seam allowance? It depends on what the interfacing is. If it's woven interfacing, yes. I always put that in the seam allowance. I can deal with the bulk. Um, and I find if I don't, especially with quilt cotton, if I don't put the interfacing in the seam allowance, that, that edge gets, like the rest of the material stays nice and flat in the same shape, but then all of a sudden the edge of the material is like wavy and it's fraying everywhere. Mm -mm. I put it all the way in there. If it's like Decoville heavy, even Decoville light, fusible fleece, foam, no, I usually cut that down. Uh, the pattern will usually tell you to do that though. Do you cut one piece at a time? Yep, I do. <laughs> I do. Unless I'm making a lot of things, I do. I will tell you, I just recently cut multiple pieces at a time, which was kind of big for me. I was making a whole bunch of cold cup cardies, which are the uh, little sleeves for the cold cups. And I had to cut a bunch of fusible fleece and I, people asked for this and I, I've had them in the shop, but I've never used them, but I decided to pull it out. This is the fusible fleece cut. And I just layered up a bunch of pieces of fusible fleece and I put this on top of it and I grabbed my rotary cutter and I just cut around all four edges. That was nice. That was fast. It was very fast. Let's see, how long does your rotary blade last? I don't know. Uh, it depends how much I'm using it. Like I said, I'm more of a scissors person. I use scissors most of the time. But again, your rotary blade will tell you when it's dead, okay? Listen to it. Don't make it keep working once it's dead. If it's nicking, if it's missing spots, if it's really hard to cut things, you have to go over a couple times, it's time to let it die and get a new one, okay? Don't lose a fingertip. So one question says, how do you get the most out of interfacing? It's so expensive, I hate wasting it. So this isn't really a pattern piece cutting thing, but I will show you. I have an interfacing scrap bin and any piece left over I put in here. I mean, even like woven interfacing, small cuts of woven interfacing, it is expensive and you can layer this up. Like it depends on what it is. Like if it's, if it's a piece of fabric where I really want to have a perfect smooth finish, then I wouldn't like hack together a bunch of pieces because I, I need it to be really smooth. But for example, I'm working on a pattern right now where I applied a layer of woven interfacing to the quilt cotton, and then I had to take a piece of foam and put it over that, and then put another piece of woven interfacing over the foam to sandwich it in because my foam is not fusible. So I was sandwiching between two layers of woven interfacing. The first layer of woven interfacing on the fabric, I made sure was a full cut because I need that to be smooth. You can tell if it's pieced together. But the back piece to just hold down the foam, I just used a bunch of random little pieces and just like glued them all over the foam. And that's fine. Yeah, always hold on to these things because you never know what kind of project you're gonna have. You might make big bags, but then you wanna make some small things. And it's no fun like getting your big roll of interfacing out to cut out a tiny little thing. So that's why I always hold on. Give yourself a little bin somewhere uh, where you keep scraps of all your interfacing because you'll use them. So that is most of the questions. I hope I answered yours if you left one um, either through the video or in the Q&A at the end. If you have any more questions about specifically cutting out pattern pieces, printing them, putting them together, things like that, leave them down in the comment section below. Um, if I can't answer them, somebody else probably can. There are way more experienced bag makers and sewers here than me. Uh, any question that was regarding making clothing, I did not answer because I don't know how to make clothing. That's still not something that I've explored on my channel uh, in the future maybe, but right now, I have no idea. But if you wanna ask a question about cutting out clothing pattern pieces, leave it down in the comment section. Uh, we have a lot of people here who do actually make beautiful wardrobes themselves and they could definitely answer your questions for you. Thank you so much for following along. I hope that this was helpful. I hope you're having a great day. Have a fantastic rest of your week. Get out there and make something. Bye guys.